Welcome to Uptown Chats, a podcast where we share stories about environmental justice by and for everyday people. I'm your co-host, Lonnie. And I'm your other co-host, Jaren. Jaren, what is our mission statement? WEAC's mission is to build healthy communities by ensuring that people of color and or low-income residents participate meaningfully in the creation of sound and fair environmental health and protection policies and practices. Great. So this episode is all about extreme heat. Too hot to handle. Too hot to handle, yes. And it's really interesting timing because we're approaching the hot season. Yet as we're recording this, it is not quite hot yet. So we but but that's not to say we haven't had hot days. We've already had some ninety degree days this year. So it's a weird year. And it's just gonna get hotter and it's gonna get hotter longer. So just because it hasn't started doesn't mean it's gonna it's gonna end so nicely at the beginning yes. of September. Yes. The weather is trying to shake us up, be like, you know, Keep, keeps on our toes, but it is definitely going to be approaching. Uh, it's it's going to be warming up here real soon. So we want to make sure that folks are prepared and are thinking about extreme heat as we go into this this time of the year that is, for some of us, quite miserable. Absolutely. What are some of the things that we're going to we're gonna t- uh, talk about today? Well, we are actually joined by four members of the Climate Justice Working Group for some interviews that we did with them about their experience around extreme heat as a part of the Climate Justice Working Group, and specifically one of the projects that they all worked on, which was an audit of the cooling centers in the city, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so they are experts here at WEAC. They've been around for, for a long time. So we're, we are going to keep our intro here short and sweet and leave it up to them to really fill in all the information that you need to know about extreme heat. So we'll also be joined after those interviews with our very own Caleb Smith to talk about our work specifically at We Act and some of the things that we're prioritizing and advocating for at We Act around extreme heat. So stay tuned and enjoy these interviews. Hi, my name is Liz McMillan. I've been with We Act as a member since 2013, and I just, in my head, did not do the math. <laughs> but it's been a while since 2013. It definitely has. And why did you decide to get involved with the Climate Justice Working Group and specifically doing your work around extreme heat? Well, I started my career in film and television and theater. I went to school for theater. So I did that for over 20 something years as a producer and project manager. So I decided that was not meaningful. So I wanted something that was going to be meaningful for, for to me in order to do the work that I wanted to do. So um, environmental issues are, have been coming up. I specifically was looking at food justice, but that's a part of um, climate justice as well. As we know, food has been one of the main contributors to climate justice, uh, well, climate change. So I decided I wanted to try and get involved in it and see where the nonprofit track would take me. Very cool. And so since you were so focused on the the food justice piece of it, where did you make the jump into working on things related to cooling and extreme heat? Where did that that connection happen? Well, just doing more work with uh, We Act. Sanal said, hey, there's a project that's coming up. So I jumped on that project that she was working on with extreme heat. I think over the course of um, doing work with We Act, extreme heat was always on the table. We've always talked about it. So uh, when that project came up, I decided to jump on that. And that was very interesting. So um, I wanted to continue the work um, since, as you saw me come in, um, people, you didn't see me. I was sweating, <laughs> <laughs> sweating profusely. And that is because it's humid outside, mm-hmm. you know, and we're not even in summer. So when mm-hmm. summer hits, it's even worse. Yeah. Do you want to take a second to kind of elaborate on the project that you're talking about that you did with Sono? Right now, I missed that. I can't remember the exact name because it was actually in 2019. Um, it's a three year project to um, get we act to get the information out to people in Harlem about the dangers of extreme heat, um, also cooling centers where we can find cooling centers. So that was one of the major things and working with the city to do something to help seniors um, so they can um, get air conditioning in the summertime to cool off. Um, so that's the project. Um, so I was on the, the first end of the project, and then I jumped over to um, the Climate Justice Working Group. So that's that's where I was. 
Something that I think is interesting that we didn't talk about with folks, the other guests as much is, especially since you have lived uptown, what was your experience prior to joining the Climate Justice Working Group and doing this work with Extreme Heat? How familiar were you with the idea of Extreme Heat and how was that? Sh- how did that show up for you in your life, like living uptown? Well, see, that's the thing. I was like, well, it's hot. Why is it hot up here? <laughs> it's so hot. You know, um, and then, of course, just doing work with we act, we act was like, well, you know, it's a heat island effect. I'm like, really? Like, what does that mean? So just knowing what like all the buildings. So depending on your street, if you have like, you know, nice brownstone street with the trees, it's a little bit cooler. But you had um, the streets that have nothing but buildings, especially this part of Harlem, upper Harlem. It's just buildings. So the heat is bouncing off the buildings, bouncing back in your face. You're like, this cannot be the way everyone lives and then i heard that harlem is specifically the hottest point in new york city so i wanted to know why and what can we do about that because Mm -hmm. you're not gonna we're not gonna get 10 foot tree tall trees to be planted um to help bring down some of that heat so we got to endure it we got to figure out a way to make sure that we're healthy um because extreme heat can lead to um very serious medical and, and, and also death. Um, we don't like to talk about that, but that's possible. Mm-hmm. Don't know this, the warning signs. Um, it's not like something that you learn in school. Hey, be prepared. Extreme heat. Mm-hmm. So you just don't know. There are kids out there. They're playing. They're playing football. They're, you know, playing in, in the parks and you just don't realize, you know, you're going and going and going and going and going. And next thing you know, something could be an extreme problem. Mm-hmm. So. I, I wanted to join and, and really talk to people. I've been talking to people, actually, mm-hmm. about extreme heat. And, and like when, every time I say, why is it so hot? I like to go into my spiel. Well, it is the heat island effect. And then the way that happens is X, Y, Z. And it really does open up people's eyes. Mm-hmm. And they're like, I really did not know that. Mm-hmm. Like, that makes sense now. I'm like, yeah. So you have to find ways to kind of keep cool. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm trying to get an air conditioner in my house. So you can talk to them about, you know, programs and mm-hmm. the programs that the city has. Um, I know a lot of people are going to be talking about the extreme heat and also the heating bills and the electric bills. Mm-hmm. So that's going to be um, something to really kind of pair into. Um, I know we have something that's going on in our bills um, to try and um, get our um, electric bills um, a little bit reduced just to help people in the city out because um, it's kind of ridiculous. So I just wanted to make sure that I was able to. You know, inform people, especially the seniors, the seniors out here, you know, they do have their senior centers. So some of them do go there. Some can't get out of their house. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have air conditioning, that's a really big problem. So Mm -hmm. just making sure like in my building, if I see a couple of seniors, I'll talk to them and make sure, oh, do you have your air conditioning? Okay, everything else. All right. Do you at least have a fan, something Mm -hmm. to kind of cool you down and the heat of the months. We've been lucky, knock on Famica, mm-hmm. um, here that I have. Um, <laughs> um, it, it hasn't gotten up to those extreme heat yet, but it's coming. Mm-hmm. It's coming. So the more we talk to people, the more they can be prepared and, and it'll be like a nice um, action plan for folks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing I love about, you know, everything that you were just talking about was this idea that you you came in with little to no knowledge about, you know, about extreme heat. And then as you've learned a lot of things and you learn about uh, cooling centers and why it's so hot and also what it can be done, you learned about the heat program and like, you know, getting the air conditioner. And then you take that information. And when you have conversations with people, you just kind of drop that knowledge. And it's like kind of like I'm pretty sure every person you've done that for has also done that to someone else. And I think that's just a really powerful way to kind of like spread the word about something. Um, once you have like knowledge about something, you know, telling mm-hmm. one person, that one person I'm sure is going to take that information and say it at some point to someone else as well. So, Oh yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, already, you know, happened. I've, I, you know, even I talk to restaurants and, you know, there's one particular restaurant I go to, the sun hits it and I'm like, you need an awning. You know, if you want people to sit outside and enjoy, mm-hmm. you know, a restaurant or even have people come because they won't sit out there in the, in the sun mm-hmm. um, to have like an awning. So he has an awning now. But, you know, because of pandemic, he's also built a um, enclosure. Mm-hmm. Um, so that way, you know, he can have some air like coming in for his his customers, because um, if not, that sun is hitting directly in your face yeah. and it's unpleasant. So, mm-hmm. you know, even not just with with. Um, our residents here in Harlem Mm -hmm. also talking to businesses. And, you know, if I get a chance, if I know the owner, I'm like, Hey, you know, 
this is what's going on and this is what extreme heat is. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have sun coming into your window, maybe get an awning. Mm -hmm. um, so pe it can be a little bit more pleasant for people to sit outside. So because, you know, you're sitting here and specifically, you know, if you're there and you're, you're having like some libations, some cocktails, and, <laughs> you I know, love the word libation. <laughs> <laughs> you're having like, your libations and you're, you're enjoying yourself, you know, and it's the sun is beating down on you. You really just don't know how quick mm -hmm. you can go into like a heat. It, your heat exposure can like cause you to become sick. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, Especially if you're having libations. <laughs> Especially if you're having libations. And we all know we need our libations. We need those. So. We do need our libations. So you don't you don't want to turn people away. <laughs> yeah. One of the other things that you talked about that I really wanted to circle back to is all the different ways that folks try to deal with extreme heat. I, I know we've mentioned uh, air conditioning as one of the main ways that people deal with heat. But again, there's some costs associated with that. Can you, I guess, reflect on just ways that both you and people that you know, like all the different ways that people try to deal with heat and like how they try to protect themselves from uh, the extreme heat during the summer? I think one of the most popular ways is the pool. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sitting outside, dipping into a pool, dipping in some um, cool water. I know for children, like in the parks, they had like the sprinkler systems to help cool them down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and also, you know, going into the movies or mm -hmm. going to the museum, something where you can go indoors. Yeah. Uh, and people normally time it like like I'm not going out at 12, one o'clock in the afternoon when mm -hmm. it, when the heat could be at this peak. Um, people would prefer to go out like four or five o'clock when things kind of cool off. Um, but, you know, nowadays it doesn't cool off. We've seen in a couple of summers where it's been like around 100 at mm -hmm. nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. Right. Mm -hmm. So, at, you know, at that point, you will hope by the time you get back home, you can run your air conditioning so you can, you know, mm -hmm. cut the cost, but try to be somewhere you can be indoors. So mm -hmm. that's how I, I normally deal with it. I know my friends deal with it as well. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the friends are, you know, the popular, they just go to the Hamptons. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that I can't do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you said that because that leads to my next, like, bit of a probing question is, do you feel like there are, besides the, the cost factor of running your air conditioner, do you feel like there are barriers to folks accessing some of those things that you mentioned for dealing with extreme heat? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you know, those things cost money mm -hmm. and we're just getting out of pandemic. You know, people are, are trying to get back to work um, or are working. Some people are still not working. Some people are being laid off as well. So um, the cost factors are a barrier. So cooling centers have to be really, really, really essential. I'm not sure how many cooling centers we have coming out this summer. Uh, have they published a list? No, it, it's, it won't be published until they actually have their first heat emergency. But that seems I, bad. <laughs> but I did talk to uh, the person who's running the cooling centers, and she's like so busy, all hands, all hands on deck right now. So she can't even have a meeting with me. So that means that they are actively mm -hmm. prepping and all. But it's literally one person. Oh. <laughs> doing all of the coordination for all of this. So it's, it's a, there's a need for money and stuff for that. There's a me, there's an extreme need for money for that. This is just one way that we're looking at climate change. I know some people, Oh, climate change, climate change. We're tired of hearing about it, but you're not tired of um, having the effect of it. Right. We got to get more people in, involved. Now, this is something that a lot more people can get involved and really get their heads around um, climate change and the work with climate justice and trying to get people into cooling centers, try to get air conditionings in people's homes so they can stay cool, try to like encourage people to dip into restaurants, museums, mm -hmm. um, or go to movies just to try and um, cool off. So it's it's important work. I think it's really a shame that the city doesn't only has one person to kind of coordinate something so large because you're looking at the whole city. We're not just talking mm -hmm. about Harlem. We're looking we're looking at all of New York City and Staten Island. I'm sure too, right? Yeah, the whole city. I have one more slight question before I get into that last one, Great. but when thinking about cooling centers versus the other options that people may not have access to because of the barriers for cost, what are some ways that cooling centers can be a little bit more appealing or what, what can they do to improve in your opinion? Well, I mean, the cooling centers turn out to be libraries, some community centers, and there's nothing much to do. They're often thought of as for seniors um, to go into them. 
it, it would be kind of cool to have like, you know, game night, um, some type of activity, um, some type of incentive for people to come in, um, maybe job preparation, like something that they can do during the day, job preparation, taxes, if you still have your taxes to be, I'm just throwing out uh, things that you could be doing at the center instead of just having it as a cooling center. And that might give some incentives of, for people to come in and, and utilize the services that are there. But I know that that might be a lot. No, that's great. I actually like those ideas because like doing things that you would need to do or want to do anyway. But, you know, if you don't have access to air conditioning or do it in AC, you can go to a cooling center to, again, like I like the idea of like there's computer setups to do your taxes or someone mm-hmm. there to help you prep your taxes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Jared and I love a game night. Yes. So like especially in the evenings, if it, when mm-hmm. it's those hot evenings, there's been time where I don't run AC sometimes, but it's been hot and I can't sleep. I'm like, it's like nine to 10 o'clock. I would definitely go to a game night somewhere yeah. <laughs> if that was the case. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it brings community together. Yeah. I think, I think that could like, you know, be helpful or movie night, you know, mm-hmm. or like the, the latest episode, you know, Netflix has all the episodes that like people like <laughs> to watch and binge watch, mm-hmm. you know, they could do that, you know, something like that. And, and you're right, right. To get up in the, the middle of the night and kind of go, but that means like the cooling centers would have to be open late. Right. Mm-hmm. And changing that programming. So yeah, that was great. Thank you for answering that. And so I'll go ahead with the last question here. And so, you know, why is the work you've done on extreme heat important? It's important because I care about my people in Harlem, my Harlem community. I do not want to see anyone suffer from extreme heat. The more knowledge that people can have, the better they can have for themselves to prepare themselves. I, I don't like to hear um, the numbers are staggering. When you talk about extreme heats during the summertime, like the deaths are, are sky high and it can be avoidable. It really can. I know that years ago we were talking about at WEACT going and maybe um, talking to some of the uh, superintendents or building owners and try to paint the, the rooftops to kind of bring down some of the, the res- residual heats in the building. Um, that's important. I live in Harlem. Um, thank God I have air conditioning, but you're right. I can't run it all the time. So I have to sit down and figure out, well, what I'm going to do during the day. I'm lucky because I have a gym membership, which is more or more like a club. Mm-hmm. So you can stay there all day and do you can do your work. Um, you can go swimming, you can, you know, work out or you can sit there and chill, watch games. They have movie nights. Mm-hmm. So th- that's a, a, that's a good place, but I'm lucky to have that membership. Mm-hmm. Everybody doesn't you need to join your gym. I was going to say, don't make sure you don't mention the name of your gym. Otherwise that's going to get real busy real quick. You're <laughs> not going to be able to find any it, space. No, 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 no. It's an <laughs> oasis. I do not give out the name. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you will after this. <laughs> we we'll, get that after, we'll get that after the recording stops. Uh, so thank you so much. I want to give you one last chance to mention anything that you wanted to talk about, anything else you wanted to share or promote while you're here that we didn't have a chance to cover yet. No, I just want to um, promote that the work that we act is doing is important. I haven't seen anyone talk about extreme heat. Not really at all. In terms of like climate change, it doesn't seem to be on the map. People are looking at big weather storms and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. But extreme heat, you know, a lot of people are so used to it. It's like, well, it's summer. Mm -hmm. It's summer. But no, it's not summer. It's 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 there's reasons why these are happening. And we need to pay attention Mm -hmm. because um, what's hot today could be hotter in years to come. It could it could really cause a lot of a lot of problems. You've seen those movies. What are the movies when it turns into the ice age? Uh, the day I, after tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. I don't want to see another movie when it turns into extreme yeah. heat. Yeah. You know, like it <laughs> yeah. turns into like the 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 moon or whatever whatever a hot planet is out mm-hmm. there. So yeah. We, we don't want to see that. That could be a good movie though. That could be a good yeah. sci fi movie. It would be a good sci fi movie. Yes. We'll, we'll work on the script. We'll send it over to you for okay. review. For review? Yeah. Yes. Okay, just as long as I get a percentage. You got that, you got that <laughs> theater background, so we need your Yeah, your also you skills. can produce it, you know. Uh, my name is Louis Kleiman, and I've been a member for uh, over 10 years. Our first question for you, then, is to, to speak about why you decided to get involved with uh, the work that we do here at WEACT. 
Uh, I've always been interested. First of all, my, my primary under, interest is uh, on water activities, swimming, boating, human powered boating, like that. And then I was the community uh, rep uh, for Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance originally, who morphed into Waterfront Alliance. Mm-hmm. And then I got to go to meet various community groups helping them, and I wasn't presenting to them. I was working with them, which is the only way that you can really show the community that you're interested in what they do. Mm -hmm. So I I work with a whole bunch of uh, uh, different grassroots groups uh, in all the five boroughs and over in New Jersey, a few. And uh, I like what uh, we acted. I live in the Upper West Side, and uh, you're relatively convenient for me. So here I am. That's why I'm here instead of uh, at the point. Amazing. Yeah, so this episode is about extreme heat. And you have done a lot of work around extreme heat. And so I wanted you to talk a little bit about what you've done, what projects you've worked on, particularly working around cooling centers. So principally, the uh, Climate Justice Working Group originally was concerned about extreme heat. Now you guys have expanded into a few other projects. But we did a survey for WEACT pre-COVID at uh, various cooling centers. I think there were about 12 on the list, 15 on the list. We divided them up. I took four of them, walked around uh, to get to the cooling centers, asked them what they were doing, interviewed the various people in the cooling centers to see what they were there for. I discovered that, number one, half of the cooling centers weren't open on regular hours. You really had to go out of your way to, mm-hmm. even when it was 101 in the shade mm-hmm. a couple of years ago, a lot of them were closed. Uh, and then some of them had their air conditions broken, which is always helpful. <laughs> the people in the cooling centers, to a great extent, didn't even know they were in a cooling center. Mm-hmm. And the uh, some of the people who were sitting there were just there because they wanted to socialize. It had nothing to do with, with being in a cooling center. Mm-hmm. So essentially, the city keeps saying that they have cooling centers, but that's really known to people like me and you and uh, uh, those who are interested. And general public doesn't really realize that there are cooling centers. There are no street signs that direct you appropriately. Mm -hmm. There are no informational things that go out on a regular basis. When you're going to talk to the public and it's uh, hot, you know that people should maybe, uh, particularly if they're older or if they're infirm, should maybe get out of their unair conditioned apartments. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have to be told about this on a regular basis. Just doing it one time really doesn't help out at all. Some of the cooling centers were very helpful, and some of them were not very helpful. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are one. Uh, some of the cooling centers are in public libraries, mm-hmm. and some of the public library people were nice, and some of them didn't ha- even have bathrooms mm-hmm. within the public local small public libraries. So what good is being in a cooling center if you're going to have to go out five blocks that, uh, where you could boil an egg on the sidewalk and, <laughs> and, and uh, have to go to the bathroom? It's stupid. Mm-hmm. A couple of them didn't even allow people to sit around all day. You had to check out a book or you had to be part of uh, doing something that was library related in mm-hmm. order to be there. So they call themselves a cooling center, but they weren't really. Mm-hmm. But some of them were okay. Yeah, it just happened to be a library with cooling, essentially. They were, it, it's interesting to hear that that so many of the places that you went to had no idea that they were supposed to be a cooling center. Signs are supposed to be published. Some of them have signs on their doors and some of them don't. There should be signs in the street with arrows and an address. Uh, you're feeling faint. You're feeling bad. It's mm-hmm. so hot. The cooling center is this way. Five minute walk from here, ten minute walk from here, mm-hmm. whatever. You know, in other words, direct pedestrians. After I hit the cooling centers, I made it a point to walk around in the local streets and ask people, "Do you know where your cooling center is?" Mm. Never got in a response mm-hmm. from anybody, and I talked to people just walking by me. I stopped by some of the EMS people working in the street where they didn't know where the cooling centers mm. were even. So uh, one of the uh, Police that uh, I asked 
Uh, the guy was nice, and he had to go to his uh, dispatcher and find out the location of it. And he was five; he was uh, maybe five minutes walk from the cooling center, and he didn't know where. It was. Wow! So I mean, you know, it's it's like they are talked about, but they're not publicly advertised, mm-hmm. and they're not uh, uh, known to the people who really should know, which are the people who are working in the street for the city. Yeah. Absolutely. And I was also going to, you know, ask you kind of a little bit and you're kind of going there a little bit now. But, you know, why are cooling centers actually important to have? Oh, well, I mean, uh, first of all, in terms of weather related illnesses, heat is the primary cause of death. I think it's about 150 or maybe more people in the city. Because of the climate catastrophe we are, we're in, and I don't like to call it climate change. I like to call it climate catastrophe because it gives you a more immediacy, uh, immediate feeling for the problem. Mm-hmm. It's going, the days are going to get hotter, and they're going to be hotter longer. And people who uh, live in high rises who don't speak English don't know a thing about it. And many of these people just don't have the money, even if they could get a free air conditioner, to turn it on because they can't afford the electric. And they really want to, when the temperature gets to be 110 in your apartment, you really should go someplace else. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm so glad that you're touching on all these different dimensions. And I wish we had more time to cover all the different aspects. And maybe we'll have... uh, Well, let me just break in one second, which is the hours of the cooling centers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're not when you have a hot day, you want to have people be able to use it all night. Mm-hmm. Most of the cooling centers are not open all night. They close at 5, they close at 6. And when, and I know I've been part of a, uh, a couple of events that had to be canceled off because it was hot at midnight at, a, at around 108 uh, a couple of years back. Mm-hmm. So to close them off at early is insanity. I mean, what good is that? Yeah, especially when at night, that's when your body needs those cool temperatures the most to be able to calm down and relax and get some sleep. So if you're going home and have super high temperatures, you're not going to be able to sleep. That's going to impact your ability to rest and recover for that next day of probably yeah, exactly extreme heat right. too. Exactly right. Especially yeah. in New York City, that urban heat island effect, and you got all of the heat that's been trapped in for throughout the day mm-hmm. gets released in the evening, and so it just it either makes it the same as it's been all night. You don't really get that relief that you do in some other. Some other climates where, mm-hmm. you know, like desert climates where when the sun goes away, it is, it's now cool. You don't get that heat. It's interesting to hear your lens of going through these cooling center audits. And I want to like take a step back and hear what your knowledge was about cooling centers before you went through and did these audits. Were you familiar with cooling centers at all or was this a new thing to you when no, you started? No, no, I, I knew about them and I knew that they were, and you'll pardon me for saying it directly, but I think essentially they are worthless to the general public the way they're set up. Mm-hmm. And I know the city has a website for it. First of all, the, uh, well, maybe it's changed, but that uh, three or four years ago, the website w- was not being updated. When, it's, when the cooling, it, there should be an app uh, or something that mm-hmm. uh, you could check out easily where a cooling center maybe is closed or it's not working or is inoperable or it's going to say whatever. But I knew about it before, and that's why I took the audits. Mm-hmm. So you were already familiar with the fact that they there were some problems with it before you got involved with doing these audits. Sure. I was working with WEAC on, on all kinds of different programming mm-hmm. uh, things that were related to uh, people without income, essentially, mm-hmm. with very low income and their needs and what has to be done to make them more comfortable living in New York City. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we kind of touched on this already a little bit, but I think it's, even though we don't have time to cover in detail, I think it's still an important, and just to reiterate, why is it so important for folks to have access to the cooling centers, especially given the, the cost of you know running air conditioning at home? Uh, particularly the cost, but... Uh, if you're infirm or you're old, excuse me, I should say elderly in this. If you have a, uh, if you're a mother with some small children, you really want to be able to get to a place where it will, well, they'll welcome you and where you can stay, if possible, overnight, because your apartment is basically unbearable. For folks that, you know, maybe in theory have 
an air conditioning unit at home. Some people are not able to, to use it because they can't afford the cost of it, right? Like, I know the city had a whole program to distribute air conditioning. You give some free air conditioning, but uh, if you can't afford the content bill, then what good is it going to do? Yeah. yeah. And we do a lot of work around that as well, which I think you've been a part of. Sure. Even some of the Albany work and state work that we've done to kind of expand the benefits of LIHEAP for those who can get the air con- free air conditioner through this program. We want to actually expand this to actually cover utility bills during the summer because they have something very similar for heating program. But but I don't think they cover 100%. I think it's a percentage. Yeah, it's not 100%. So I have, I think, one one more kind of like closing question. Um, Should be two more. I'll give you the last one you should ask me. Okay, great. Well, my first closing question then, you uh, already mentioned one thing that you think could be improved, which is like the the interface that there should be an app for folks to be able to find. Yeah, and that's only that only works for people who, in fact, have uh, internet ability or yes. have a mobile or, or whatever. But the biggest thing that should be done is non-electronic signs posted all over the place mm-hmm. with uh, information given out as to what it's why it's there and what it's for. Mm-hmm. In addition to those things, what are some other like recommendations that you would make, ha- having gone through this process of looking at all these cooling centers that you think could be made to improve access to you know cool spaces during the summer? So that was, that's going to be my last point, I think, which is a nudge to WEAC, who should be, I think, putting more effort during the summer to continuously approach people in the houses and put out flyers and put out information on a regular basis so people are and and in all the languages that are in the neighborhood so that people in fact have a consciousness of the of the idea that there is something out there that could help them when they feel that they're unbearable mm-hmm. i think uh, uh working with kids i am a firm believer of going into the public schools and doing presentations to kids ages kindergarten up through the 12th grade, give them some material, let them take it home for the parents to look at. Mm-hmm. But kids generally, if they believe in a program, will start pushing their uh, those who they live with in order to do something that they think is the correct thing to do. Yeah. Kids are the best. Kids, anything that kids bring home to their parents, they will become the ambassador for that, yeah, whether it's true. composting or origami Whatever kids like to do and become ambassadors for. In addition to those things that you mentioned, what are some things that you think that the city could do to to expand, like better improve these cooling centers or other ways of... Physically as opposed to simply putting up notices at various points, including bus stops and whatever. I didn't really say where where the sign should be, but nevertheless... They have to go out and do a real strong educational job on a regular – you can't just go to a center at the beginning of the season and expect people who are running the various centers to know what's happening. There's a churning of employees. Uh, It's good that each of the uh, patrons who live – who work in a cooling center have some knowledge of first aid in case somebody, in fact, has some problems mm-hmm. and what to look for for symptoms so that they know to call 911. Uh, there should be material in the cooling centers for everybody. Comic books are great if the city could produce some cooling center comic books and leave mm-hmm. it so for the kids to pick up at, while they were in the cooling center and perhaps when they're doing tabling around as well as putting them out on uh, various uh, uh, organized events like street mm-hmm. fairs and things like that. Mm-hmm. Do regular audits and not just one time only. Is the air conditioning working? Is water available? Is bathrooms available to the public? Mm-hmm. Do the uh, people who are running cooling centers know that some people will be coming there and uh, because they have a problem and are they uh, are they made welcome? Uh, mm-hmm. Are there things for the kids to do for those parents who bring in uh, children on a regular basis? I know it's probably impossible, but there are food programs. It would be great if some of the food programs could be extended mm-hmm. where uh, people will go where there's free food. So if some mm-hmm. of the free food was being delivered in the evening mm-hmm. at the cooling center, mm-hmm. uh, particularly when there's a heat emergency, mm-hmm. that's one way to draw the public into the center itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, Lewis practically wrote the report, the cooling center report, because you were part of the audits. And so all of those kind of recommendations that, you know, we when 
the climate justice working group got together after doing all the audits and seeing all that work, you know, thought about how do we improve cooling centers as a way for people to have access to cooling? Because we believe, especially at WEAC, that they are still vital, that they're a very important aspect to the landscape. Even if we were to give everyone an air conditioner, like you said, you have the issue of running it and the cost, right? We still need as many options as possible for people to, to be able to basically stay cool and beat the heat. And, and remember, a lot of people live in substandard wiring. So some people will blow all the fuses, they turn on the air, can even if they wanted to do it, they're not going to be necessary, particularly the uh, uh, two room, uh, uh, the, the two family homes and, and like that. You know, mm-hmm. you, you just don't know how good their electric is. Right. And New York City has a very old housing stock. So very old, yeah. uh, particularly up here. Yeah. So I thank you for all of that insight. I have one. Actually, this is my final question. I promise. And, and then is, I'm going to give you one last comment. Great. I, I can't wait. So obviously, you've been so involved in the work that we act does, especially with the Climate Justice Working Group. Can you give like just a little bit of information about why you think that other people should join in working groups at we act or just in the Climate Justice Working Group specifically? What What about your work do you feel like has been most meaningful for you? Uh, working with neighborhood populations, mm-hmm. uh, I just enjoy feeling uh, 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 that uh, the public itself is gaining something by WEAC's activities mm-hmm. uh, in terms of their ability to cope with living in New York City mm-hmm. and getting knowledge that maybe they wouldn't otherwise have mm-hmm. w- uh, when we can, can, pro- can provide to them. Uh, various forms of information. Absolutely. Great. Thank you for that. Mm, I love it. So my last uh, comment. Let's hear it. Uh, it's going to be hot. Mm-hmm. Remember, there are 25 boathouses. It's perfectly safe. We have never had a casualty in the last 15 years of the of 115,000 people getting into the water, mm-hmm. and it's free. So get out, take a look. You, all you have to do is free kayaking in New York City, and you know, we'll pop up a whole list of stuff. Uh, and uh, hope to see you on the water sometime. I love that. As someone who loves kayaking, cannot recommend that enough. Thank you so much. You guys got to take me kayaking now. Let's do it. Hello, my name is Taisha, and I'm the community organizer at WEAG. We're having our annual membership barbecue that's happening July 15th at PSMS 149 Sojourner Truth, which is located at 41 West 117th Street. We will have food, games, short film presentation, and our very own Uptown Chats recording live. You can RSVP at our website at weact.org slash events. Can't wait to see you there. So I'm Stuart Aronson. Uh, I've been involved with, with WE Act for now over three years. And I suppose, uh, you know, I became involved. A friend introduced me to WE Act. And I had been, I had started to look for an opportunity to, to become active with regard to uh, what I had been hearing about in terms of the climate crisis. And um, I understood through this friend that, that we act uh, would be a place where I would find an opportunity to get involved and to maybe begin to do something about uh, this uh, challenge. I appreciate that background to like just get a sense of how you got into the work, and I wanted to get a sense of how did you decide to get involved with the climate justice working group specifically and do the work that you've been doing around extreme heat. Well, I suppose also I would include uh, getting involved, you know, my, my beginning to get involved was also, and I, I do share this, uh, related to having 20-something kids. And uh, so everything that I was hearing about the climate crisis suggested that things were going to, were getting worse and uh, that their experience in the future and their children's experience was going to be uh very dismal. So I, so again, that got, got me involved and I, I started to think about what I could do. When I became involved, there were uh, a number of opportunities that presented themselves that, in going to membership meetings and hearing about the working groups. And 
the matter of extreme heat, especially in this uptown neighborhood, my uptown neighborhood, was very, seemed very concrete and, and very um, real. And so the idea that we act uh, was providing the opportunity to address literally and concretely cooling opportunities for people who are experiencing extreme heat and don't have access to AC, let's say, or, um, you know, have no way of, of getting cool in extreme heat conditions. Um, and, and we act had identified that the cooling center's system was, was not as effective and not as useful in its current state. And that seemed like a, a very concrete opportunity to do something uh, to address that particular problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, you know, it's, you know, there's like the problem that you guys noticed well, with the cooling center and then wanting to go in and, and do this project for what, you know, the cooling center audits, right? And I know you, that you had a lot of experience with that uh, project here with the Climate Justice Working Group. And my question is like, what was that experience like when you were going through the process, whether it be if you want to talk us through creating the survey and like doing the doing the actual audits, like what kind of things did you experience and what were some of your takeaways? So the actual the actual work that became uh, available for the Climate Justice Working Group that was taking up the matter of the cooling center included, and this was exciting to me personally, because um, our our goal in doing surveys, let's say, about the cooling centers was to really get empirical evidence for how the cooling centers were operating. And I, I, and I, and I thought that um, having concrete uh, empirical evidence for how the cooling centers were working would be very helpful in affecting change in those operations. So the cooling center was intended to be this uh, oasis. And so we went to find out, was it? And uh, what we learned in visiting the cooling centers at the times that they were meant to be open was that there was often no evidence at the cooling center that this was a cooling center. Mm -hmm. uh, so direction, how to get there, there wasn't the signage that would have that was seemed required and necessary. the The cooling center was welcoming, but we it was clear and you know self reported by the people there that they had no training, for example, about the effects of heat or uh, so that they might be prepared to deal with somebody who was having a clinical kind of reaction to to heat stroke or. Uh, there would uh, we were were finding that there were no snacks or or anything in the way of food that could address needs at the time. Changing tables and uh, opportunities with children, games and other things. Any structure, no. So while while that was disappointing, it was also providing useful information that was then going to be used and was used in lobbying and advocacy work that we got engaged with to uh, to develop a bill that would um, require, that would provide monitoring and reporting and supervision and some of these elements that we, we thought would be important and should be there. I was going to say, I love that kind of, you know, starting from that kind of grassroots community-based research and kind of just a group of people getting together concerned about uh, these cooling centers, which the city wasn't auditing, right? It wasn't doing what the things that you guys uh, did yeah. and saying, okay, now let's use this data and this information and what we know to create a bill or to, uh, you know, add to a bill to strengthen this, uh, this program. And I think that's just a really kind of cool progression to say, like getting involved in a way of saying so simply just going into a cooling center and, you know, doing these audits to, the creation of some type of legislation to hopefully get through and pass, which we are working on getting that back, that bill back. Into <laughs> so play. I hear, so I hear because it did, it stalled, uh, despite the fact that we visited council members and, um, 
worked worked collaboratively with council offices on language and so forth and elements of that bill. So mm-hmm. um, hopefully, you know, this has been a, this is a slow job. Yeah. Um, you know, with the, it, you mentioned about grassroots and so forth, and so having having a a, a background in in the hospital setting in the in this community. You know, it was obvious that people were talking about the amount of asthma that was being presented, the amount of cardio problems in this community where the health infrastructure is also, you know, very weak. And then the interact, and then it was, it was clear that the, that there's an interaction between pollution, diesel exhaust in this community, the bus depots, uh, here. And, uh, so again, it was using the information on rates of these illnesses in the community and elevated rates, the effects of the environment on some of those conditions specifically to uh, encourage activism and lobbying so forth to get to address the fossil fuel matter and the matter of electrification to address some of the pollution which is impacting which was impacting on and does on health conditions in the community so there's been some success in in that department at the state level at the city level in predicting uh that we're going to be all electric buildings but you know in the at the present in the present time you have a community that is suffering from the heat you see the health effects, and then when you look at mitigating factors like uh, air conditioning, which is is not not everybody has air conditioning, and uh, at the same time, people who are in the community who have air conditioning often can't afford the electric bills. I mean, my my electric bill is thirty or forty dollars in. It, usually, and in the summer, it's nearly three hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Wow! So, and, and this points to some other areas of activism, which has to do with efforts to control uh, the cost of utilities. So, there are a lot of things that we act has been involved with that you know I've appreciated and and shared in the in in some of that work and. It, it continues. Yeah, and I appreciate talking about some of the cost dimensions of the cooling needs, and just really trying to cover some of the dimensions of the extreme heat issue. In addition to the the cooling center challenge, and and some of the lessons that you learned uh-huh. from that, and thinking about extreme heat kind of holistically, especially in the landscape of New York City, I want to like kind of circle to our our last question, but kind of use it as a bit of an opener to touch on extreme heat things in general in addition to the cooling centers which is why is the work that you've done around the cooling center audits and other things as a part of the climate justice working group why is that work on extreme heat important and why should people maybe care about it and be involved in in moving that work forward well i i think that there has been evidence and documentation and research done in cities that has that's found greening or gardens and trees and plants and shrubs in communities that the the greener the safer I mean, it's it's that if you have a greener environment not only does it impact the, the heat and you know they talk about the heat island effect that is experienced uptown notably that Empirically, again, it's it's warmer in Upper Manhattan than it is in other parts of the city, and and uh, so they use that expression, you know, heat island. Increasing greenery um, would not only affect temperature, but it has an effect on the communities on on violence, on violence reduction, and so, you know, the. It is a holistic view of this, uh, of this whole matter of extreme heat, that introducing elements which will affect 
the climate also affect the social lives of people in the community. So, you know, it's kind of trite to say a win-win, but it's, uh, you know, a very significant matter to maintain awareness of. Yeah. And to build on that, and I think also to summarize some of the things that you mentioned earlier related to your, you know, cooling center audits, what, what do you say are some of the top priorities for both the city and I guess the state in general to like make actionable steps to help improve kind of the landscape and help improve the conditions for folks dealing with extreme heat? What could the city or the state do to make it easier for people to to bear the extreme heat that we are starting to see and we will continue to see? I think the, I think the, the electrification, that direction, you know, I think it's a very important because of the pollution and how that affects health conditions in the community. And people who are vulnerable then are more susceptible to the effects of extreme heat. So if you have a healthier community, you're, you're already having a mitigating effect with regard to the impact of extreme heat. So, so that's, that's one thing. I think that we, we talked about it, I mentioned earlier, I mean, affecting the cost of, let's say, u- utilities, you know, is very important to allow people to use an air conditioner and making those air conditioners available, but being able to afford to use them. And, and also this whole matter of the infrastructure of the, of housing, weatherization and, and so forth as a way of, again, mitigating some of the effects of, of extreme heat. I like both of those things, both because I, I'm a strong advocate for improving air quality, and I appreciate that you touched on that relationship because they are definitely related on days that we have extreme heat. We often have poor air quality and that the vulnerable people that are impacted by each of those things. There's a huge overlap there, and when you address one, you address the impacts of both. Right, and I don't think we can forget about the, the, the whole dimension of health and, and what can be done in mitigating just the health outcomes of extreme heat. I mean, you have stroke and you have other outcomes. So you have people going to hospitals, cold water in the ER. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, let's have that available uh, for anyone. Mm -hmm. It's it's a simple thing, but it just addresses in some ways or suggests how our infrastructure, whether it's the electric grid or it's water in the ER, or it's the cooling center being useful, accessible, available, and an informed citizens. So education and information all interact to ultimately result in a, in a healthier and safer environment. All right, Nan. So we're just going to start with a very simple, if you just want to introduce yourself, um, how long you've been a member of WEACT and how you kind of got involved with WEACT. Yeah, my name is Nan Fessler. I live here in Central Harlem. I moved to New York about seven and a half years ago, and I had been very active politically a lot of my life. I came to New York. I had retired. Um, I had been living in Los Angeles, and I wanted to do um, political work, mainly looking at, you know, working around climate justice and environmental work. I had read a little bit about We Act, made an appointment to have coffee with Louis Bailey. Mm-hmm. He sold me right then and there, and I became a member of We Act. So I guess about seven and a half years now, and I'm thrilled. I talk about We Act in glowing terms for the last seven and a half years. Oh, we'd love to hear that. Oh, that Bailey's a great ba- salesman. He absolutely. could sell. He could sell candy to a candy salesman. <laughs> so here's your candy back to you. Um, well, thank you for that that intro. I know, I'm so happy that. We have so many folks who have been around WEACT for so long because I feel like it, it speaks to like 
the the level of engagement that some folks have with our work. And I think that one of the things that we want to touch on specifically is around extreme heat. So I want to get a sense of how did you decide to get involved with first the Climate Justice Working Group and then specifically work around extreme heat? Well, I, even before the Climate Justice Working Group was brought together, I very much, you know, participated in all the monthly WEAC meetings. I did some of the, oh, voter registration. Um, we talked about, you know, especially, I, I, I think even maybe before we did, um, Ranked choice voting, we might have been out and about. So, and again, most of that work had been with Bailey, but I mean, there were other, you know, climate justice people working together. And then, you know, Sonal had taken over. And it, at that point, the group, you know, coalesced and where we started to say, as a group, we're really going to meet separately and we are going to make sure that we're going to look at issues and policy mm -hmm. and try to, you know, as a group, strategize to figure out, you know, how to move this work forward. Amazing. And, and, and so to answer your question about the, um, Extreme heat. I mean, that was just one of the projects. And we were all, you know, said, yeah, we should do that. And I don't remember. It was probably, you know, either it was Sonal was still running that program. You know, now I know you, LJ and Annie are very involved with mm -hmm. the Climate Justice Working Group. But the question of cooling centers had come up. And I think that there had originally been some, um, you know, at least correspondence and or conversation with then city council member Costas Constantinides, mm -hmm. who had an intro, of course, in the moment, I don't remember that intro number. And now it would be a different number on uh, he's also he left city council. But it was a bill around the cooling centers. And we saw it not moving and a little deficient. Mm -hmm. But, and again, I don't know where the impetus of the idea came from. I don't know if it was us as a group or Sonal and, we, you know, we ex staff, but we made the decision, and this is pre the pandemic lockdown, the COVID lockdown, to go out and audit the cooling centers here in Northern Manhattan. And it sounded like this is what's got to be done because one of the things I do a lot of work with New York Renews, which we act as one of the 360 members of New York Renews, and I do um, a lot of grassroots lobbying. And I know how important, you know, getting laws on the, you know, take a bill to make it a law and have it on the books, but it's also got to be implemented effectively or it sits there and doesn't do anything. And we as citizens need to always make sure that we have eyes mm -hmm. on what we want. We want to make sure this stuff gets done and done right. And it's mm -hmm. up to us as citizens to really make sure that it's being implemented properly. So when it was brought to the fore that we could go out and actually audit I say, yeah, this could, and we audited when it was damn hot. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like, yeah, we're going to see if these things really work. Mm -hmm. And it was an eye opener to all of us that participated in that study. Yeah. I love how you opened with the, with the idea of that cooling center bill, which again, we have been trying to get reintroduced multiple times. So maybe by the time this podcast air, we will actually have it reintroduced. So I like how you kind of led with this idea of, you know, there was a policy that, you know, wasn't maybe not been perfect, but needed some type of push and some type of polish to kind of, you know, push the working group into investigating cooling centers. And I know you are one of our members who are very heavy in the policy and the politics aspect of everything. And so can you talk a little bit about what kind of work you've been doing? Advocacy work and grassroots lobbying is something that you mentioned as well um, around extreme heat at the city state level as well. Because I know you do a lot of stuff at the state level, too. Yeah, I would say, you know, in the last couple of years, I've been doing more state stuff. And of course, so again, you know, we act as a, a very important, um, you know, partner in New York Renews. And so the the climate jobs and justice package that New York Renews had also included as one of the bills, the New York Heat Act, which is close, but, you know, sad to say, I, I, with the New York legislative session ending this Thursday, I'm not sure it's actually going to pass. But policy like that, even though it 
doesn't directly hit the extreme heat if you're looking at it from a very narrow perspective. The fact that when we're looking at extreme heat, why are certain neighborhoods so incredibly vulnerable to it? I mean, obviously, we know the difference between a city as dense as New York and suburban areas like Westchester or rural areas up, you know, north in the Catskills. You know, New York City and especially Central Harlem, South Bronx, we don't have the green space. We do not have the tree canopy that you know, helps to absolutely keep the heat down. And so we have all of this infrastructure, you know, this concrete infrastructure that makes the city so much hotter. And then, you know, you're looking at just the demographics of um, northern Manhattan, South Bronx, a lot of the Bronx, actually. And demographically, it is lower income and a lot of people of color and, you know, experiencing, you know, the systematic uh, racism that we've lived under for, you know, God knows forever. And we, therefore, those of us here will experience a lot more extreme heat. So coming back to that... Why aren't people, you know, you could say, well, people could turn their air conditioner, their AC on. Well, A, you have to have it in the first place. And B, even if you have an AC, you have to have the money to pay. And I pay, I mean, I live, I'm a renter. Here in New York, landlords are obligated to provide heat. But extreme heat can be as deadly as extreme cold. And therefore, I also feel like I'm kind of jumping ahead and we'll come back to the New York Heat Act, but the reality to me is I would love to see policy that would get through the state legislature and be signed by the governor that actually says landlords. Now, maybe it can't be done in older buildings, but in new construction, that AC must be included if you are renting, because it is absolutely important. So going back to the New York Heat Act, one of the things that would, you know, there's so many other aspects to the New York Heat but, Act, but what I want to bring it back to vis-a-vis this conversation we're having is that it would cap the utility bills to 6% of, of someone's income. And that means that, yeah, if they did have AC, then yeah, they, somebody might in their own home be able to run the AC and cool themselves down. Because while the cooling centers are a good idea, I think that they're still important. It, it, we saw so many deficits when we did the auditing. And we know, even if we were to the bill that may end up being reintroduced, and we do get the extension of hours um, because just because the sun goes down at eight o'clock doesn't mean all of a sudden it gets cool, right? right? <laughs> and um, you know the we the, the sun decides to be really hot on the weekends and the cooling center is not open on the weekends. All right, so really in the very end, the smartest idea in the world would to be to have some sort of air conditioning whether that be per unit or building and obviously you know you know any kinds of you know com- companion policy would that would allow for you know retrofitting to make sure a building's even more energy efficient both mm-hmm. for heat and for cooling all of that is absolutely necessary yeah i really appreciate you providing that really like comprehensive look at the different dimensions of what people need in terms of being able to protect themselves from extreme heat. And since you mentioned the cooling center audits, I figure this is a good time for you to tell us a little bit more about it, especially from your perspective. What did that process look like? And what were some of the things that you learned from doing that? What I learned the most was that the people who were generally at the desk, whether they might have been use an old fashioned term of like the receptionist and admin assistant up to the actual manager of a particular cooling center often didn't fully understand what it meant to be a cooling center. So, you know, 
starting off, the we had issues with even signage. Often the signage was, you know, it might be at the building, but you didn't, you know, exactly know where, you know, you were going to get to go to get into a cooling center. But the people working there, we really felt needed to be trained. And they not only needed to be trained on what it really meant to, you know, if we were in these situations where, you know, temperature was at least 100 degrees for one day or over 95 for two days, that they were going to be open. They needed to make sure that they were going to be able to provide cold water, that there would be able to provide seating for people. We, I felt, and I'm speaking for just for myself. I know that other participants, although I, you know, we did a full study, uh, I really found that the folks managing these facilities didn't fully understand and also weren't really trained on what would happen. Would you be able to recognize somebody who was experiencing heat? you know, exhaustion, much less, let's say, a heat stroke. I mean, most people did say, I said, what would you do if you saw somebody in true discomfort? They said, well, they would call 911, which, of course, is what they should be doing. But I went into one facility. First off, they didn't didn't want to open the door. And I'm not going to name the facility, (laughs) but they didn't want to open the door. And then when they did let me in, they go, we have no place for you to sit. And I said, well, this is a cooling center. The city has said this is a designated cooling center. And uh, right now, the temperature meets the requirements for you to be open. And would it be possible for me to get any water? No. And their AC was also not working. Mm-hmm. So, again, just huge disappointment mm-hmm. that there, you know, the city had provided these cooling centers, but and that particular school center was going to be closed by five o'clock. So again, um, I just, we, we saw so many deficiencies that we knew that we needed a new bill and uh, a city council person who would be able to really have the clout to push it through, to make it happen. And, you know, for the bill to be much more robust, but I, I still want to go back to what I said earlier. Um, I really think that the the real way of dealing with extreme heat, which we are going to see more and more and more of, is to really provide in people's homes a way for them to stay cool in the luxury of their own home. Where I mean, the other thing about the cooling centers is you'd walk in and there were no books. Mm-hmm. You know, there were you would have a place to sit, but how that's not inviting and probably for me the few cooling centers that were probably the most inviting were our city libraries however they also have hours where they were closed by six o'clock and some of them here in central harlem not open on the weekends so uh that made it really tough at least at the library you could read a book or read a magazine or put your own headphones on and listen to some music. Absolutely. I have a question. It's kind of, it's backtracking a little bit, but can you just kind of set up a little bit about what the cooling center audits were and like, how did that kind of come about? And like, what were you, when you were going into the audits, like some of the things that you were looking at in that process? A, a good question, LJ. Uh, I almost wish I had the, the cheat sheet in front of me. Um, you know, we, we helped to design it and we also, well, we helped to design it. We, it got designed. I know that we act work with some outside consultants and then we also critiqued it. And then after, you know, we did the audit, audits, we critiqued it again, but we were looking at, you know, signage. We were looking at hours that they were open. We looked at, you know, what kind of um, accessible bathrooms they had for somebody who might be in a wheelchair. What if it was a, a mother with children? Were there in the bathrooms, you know, baby changing tables, things like that? Um, you know, uh, just again, going back to what I just said a few minutes ago, like, were there you know, games or, you know, places for people, comfortable places for people to sit, to read was, you know, obviously besides water being available, were there other drinks? Would there be food? Could people bring in their own food if they wished? 
you know, could they, was there a charging, you know, could electrical outlets so people could charge their phone? I mean, it was a, it seemed like these are such tiny little things, but they add up and they're absolutely essential for a center to actually work. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really about making people feel comfortable in these spaces and actually want to use them. Because it's one thing, like so many other things, to have a space that serves a purpose. It's another thing for people to actually want to go there and use it. I felt, and I think the folks who worked with uh, us on this felt pretty similar that it was a colossal colossal disappointment. Mm -hmm. And again, it was as if the city had checked off a box you know, all around the city, you know, from, you know, lower Manhattan to northern Bronx or what, whatever, there are cooling centers. Um, but if they don't work for people and uh, we went only on the hot days, mm-hmm. so the extreme heat days, and I would walk in and no one was there. Mm-hmm. because they needed to cool off, except for a few people that I did talk to in our local libraries. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for answering that question. I know, Lonnie, do you have anything else to add? I have one more. I know Nan is a woman of action. And <laughs> so, you know, when if you think about someone who wants to get involved in like this work and like the grassroots lobbying, what would be your suggestion or like where would they start or where should they start? I tell, it's always interesting. Um, every organization I've ever joined, you first walk in and you know nobody and you feel like a little bit like a wallflower and it's a little tough. And I've said to people, you just, it's kind of like, you know, when you go to the beach and the water's a little chilly, you could stick your toe in and pull it back, stick the toe in and pull it back until you just run and dive in. You're not going to swim. So I feel like I tell people, you just got to do it. And it's best if you're maybe a little shy, come and bring a friend and do it together. So get in, do the work. The moment you start doing the work, there's sa- there's satisfaction. And I think we all, we do the work not only because we love our neighbors and our community, but it makes us feel good. I want to do the work because I feel good doing it. And I feel empowered that I, I'm like... It, you know, the progress is slow, but there is. And if you feel accomplished when you do it. So I tell people, jump in, do the work. You can start smaller or, or large. It doesn't matter. Just get in, do the work. You will meet fabulous people. They will become your friends. And I, there's nothing better. All right. Thanks so much for joining us, Caleb. For our audience, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and your your name, title, and anything else? Yeah. My name is Caleb Smith. I am the Resiliency Coordinator at WE Act. Formerly, I was one of the first Cecil Corbin Mark Fellows, so I'm happy to stay on with WE Act as the new Resiliency Coordinator. My role entails working mostly at the city level, but also there's a ramp up to working on more state advocacy around resilient infrastructure, whether that's through policymaking, community education, and organizing. Mm. Uh, just for, for folks who are not as familiar with the space, we use the word resilient a lot, and I think we've maybe talked about it in other episodes before, but just for folks who aren't as solid about what we mean when we talk about resilient communities and resiliency. What does that mean to you? Yeah. So resiliency in my mind is the proactive response to environmental hazards or disasters. So when we're talking about resiliency, we're talking about the skills and knowledge that community members have to respond to extreme heat, as well as the infrastructure available to them to reduce the risk that they face from extreme heat events. Amazing. That's really solid. Yeah, that's a really good definition. That should, that should be in a book. Caleb, do you want to give us a little bit of a rundown of like what what's the come for React in this uh, heat as we go into extreme heat season? Yeah. So I'm stepping into quite the long path in into extreme heat work. React has been working on it a long time before I joined. 
But one major thing that I'm getting off the ground is our Extreme Heat Coalition, which we are organizing with a couple other groups and we'll we'll be expanding over time. But we're all working on extreme heat in different capacities. Some organizations are also community based environmental justice focused, but others are focused on housing or organizing the faith community and various other social issues. And our mission is to mobilize to ensure that urban, historically marginalized and vulnerable communities that are exposed to extreme heat are protected through policy, adaptation planning and resilient infrastructure interventions that advance health equity because we see very stark differences in health outcomes for communities of color especially those like northern Manhattan and the Bronx and some parts of Brooklyn, where there are also compounding issues of air quality and high asthma rates. Uh, so those things really make a, a transformative impact in terms of the lived experience of people when they respond to the heat season. Some other things that we've been engaged on outside of the coalition we have also been a part of NYSERDA's Extreme Heat Action Planning Forum, which has been a way for various stakeholders across the state to inform how NYSERDA is going to invest into various different adaptation planning strategies and solutions coming up. So we just had the the last meeting there, and now they're kind of in a new phase um, with an advisory council that is going to help kind of tweak some of the, some of the things that we identified as primary action plans that um, are important to us. Just really quickly before I forget, for folks that don't know what NYSERDA is, can you uh, just spell that out and say why they would be, you know, involved with this work around extreme heat. Yeah. So NYSERDA is the New York State Energy (laughs) Research and Development Authority. Uh, I I just laugh because (laughs) it's the longest state acronym that I can think of. But NYSERDA is one of the lead climate and energy agencies at the state level. So anything that relates back to disadvantaged communities as it relates to the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, they are really managing the implementation of how those communities get the investments that they are long overdue. And with regard to extreme heat, a lot of that looks like infrastructure projects and community programming to to sort of make sure that folks know how to access resources responding to extreme heat. I think it's really interesting that NYSERDA is the one that is a part of kind of some of this extreme heat work, but it's also not surprising because as you even just mentioned, all the different kind of like the intersectional aspect of extreme heat. So when we're talking about extreme heat, we're not just talking about extreme heat itself. You mentioned health, we talked about infrastructure, and then also energy as well. And so I think, you know, those are kind of really interesting key pieces to the extreme heat work that we are doing here. Can you tease out some of those like components for everyone to listen, like how do those kind of different things, how, how are we working in the, within those different spaces? One, one major component to extreme heat has a lot to do with green infrastructure. A major reason why communities of color are not as uh, well positioned to handle extreme heat is because of the legacy of disinvestment in just basic community resources, particularly green space. I saw something recently that showed in New York City predominantly black neighborhoods have access to about a quarter of the the parkland acreage compared to white neighborhoods. And what that means is they're getting about a quarter of the environmental services that trees provide when compared to their white counterparts. And 
trees trees provide cooling through shade and um and and large density evapotranspiration so a lot of that is big word i love it yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> getting so sciencey up in I'll, here I'll, I'll break it down but <laughs> evapotranspiration basically is just the process of the water leaving the the leaves and and that when trees are especially mature trees are doing that in in large groupings like in parks that cools the the area the immediate area uh, by a couple of degrees and it doesn't sound I, I wish I had the, the exact numbers on hand but um, that makes a huge difference and especially when they're shading our our buildings um, that also goes back to energy you had mentioned before because when there's less of the sun's heat and radiation being trapped on these like dark building materials, then that means there's less energy required to cool down the interior. Um, and that, that makes a huge difference for, for residents who either don't have access to air conditioning or can't afford to run it to the extent that they'll actually be comfortable in their own homes. So that, that makes a major difference when you don't have access to, you know, adequate green space in your neighborhood. Essentially, when we have these disparities in green space, we have communities of color that have to spend more money on their heat, their, their cooling during the summer because their buildings are hotter, essentially. So that not only is there a, a higher burden already because those buildings are probably older and less maintained, but they also are going to be hotter because there's less green space in those, in those spaces too. That's right. And of course, it doesn't just start and end with trees. There are some other ways that we're exploring and trying to scale up cooling of the built environment. That includes the green roof and solar roof programs at the city level, but they aren't adopted at the extent that we need in the neighborhoods that need them most. But they work in a similar way. Like for one, the solar roof program captures the sun's energy and converts it into energy for the building. And that offsets the need for electricity that's fossil fueled by the utility. Mm -hmm. And then with green roofs, you have the, the same benefit of trees, except it's on the roof of the building. Mm -hmm. Maybe not as much the evapotranspiration aspect, just because trees are much larger than the, the kind of vegetation that can go on a roof. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it's a similar concept, and it, it works in a similar way. So those are things that are, are pretty important to make use of, because we're in a really densely packed <laughs> environment. Like New York City is the cityest city in the United <laughs> States. I love that. Good the cityest <laughs> city in the it United States. It just is. And so when we can't have all this extra land to spare to create new park spaces, how are we using the space that's available? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's something that's going to be an important tool in the the broad range of strategies that we're going to have to use. Yeah, I feel like it's such a connected issue, right? There's you have to, you know, if you solve for one thing or you're working towards one thing, it helps solve another thing that helps solve another thing that helps solve another thing that gets to the extreme heat um, work that that that's being done. So it's kind of like all of it has to happen at once and at the same time. Like we can't, there's no, well, we have to start here. We need to do this first. It's more so all of these things need to happen simultaneously. Yeah. And speaking of strategies, since, you know, you, you circled this there, can you talk about some of the, the strategies and policies that we have prioritized uh, here at WEACT around all the extreme heat work? Yeah. Well, recently there was a city council hearing. We... We provided testimony on on two uh, introductions that are going to really make sure on, on the green space front um, that New York City moves forward in a really thoughtful and equitable way, really thinking long term for the tree canopy and how that impact impacts our communities. 
So one of those is Introduction 1065, and this bill helps get us to the amount of tree cover that would really make a substantial difference in terms of extreme heat. That would get us to uh, urban canopy coverage goal of 30%, and it would also help set up metrics to expand and protect the urban forest to require the collection of LIDAR data, which is light detection and ranging, which is basically a technology that helps us get really granular data on where there's vegetation throughout the city. And this would monitor effectiveness of the plan, and this would require updates every 10 years. So really building in that longevity. And we spoke out to to make sure that added to, to this bill, we want to see some more amendments that one, uplift funding for the Department of Parks and Recreation. There's been a lot of movement for funding the, the Parks and Recreation Department at at least 1% of the, the city's operating budget. If you just go to Central Park, you might think, oh, our, our funding is fine. But people who aren't totally dialed in on, on how Central Park is funded, a lot of that is privately funded. Um, and when you get to the outer boroughs or more low-income neighborhoods, there's a lot of need to make sure that our parks are properly maintained. Kind of zooming out a little bit more, another way that we see that underfunding is th- the fact that parks has not been able to keep pace with the tree planting and maintenance that they have in previous years. So last compared to last year, they've planted, I want to say, 45% fewer trees uh, in the first four months. This is cited in the mayor's preliminary management report that came out in February of this year, if you want to take a deeper dive. But that's that's really important. And I, I should also mention that that 1% funding goal was something that was pro- promised on the campaign trail by the Adams administration. So if this is something that our leadership knows and they aren't following through on it, we're all about accountability. Another piece of this is a, making sure that urban canopy goal is time bound. Like if you've been in any sort of management or even life skills class, they teach you smart goals. You need a timeline within which to complete this. So 30% uh, canopy cover no later than 2035 is essential. And then another piece is, again, just recognizing how the urban canopy affects different parts of our community. So this would make sure that in in the management of uh, the urban forest, that there are considerations for environmental justice, climate change, health, accessibility, and workforce development. And particularly, we want to see it prioritized within disadvantaged communities as laid out by the uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act definition. And then lastly, another amendment we want to see accounting for the, the distinct needs of trees at various points in their lifespans and uh, a plan for wood salvaging, whether, you know, we lose trees um, from major storms or or disease and various other natural factors like that, that's an opportunity to, to make sure that there are jobs at the end of the lifespan of the trees and the the maintenance early on in, in the lifespan of a tree. If we get trees planted and in the first five to 10 years, it's not well taken care of, we'll never get the full benefit of that tree. And it's not a responsible use of taxpayer money. And it's also just under delivering on on promises that are really just common sense for our, our neighborhoods. So 
Yeah, I've I've heard a lot about uh, the fact that planting trees is is cool. People love to talk about it. People love hearing it. But those young trees aren't providing that real benefit of cooling that we talk about when we talk about trees and green space and what that does in terms of cooling off neighborhoods, right? We need those mature, well-rounded trees, not those angsty teen trees. (laughs) (laughs) The awkward face trees. Awkward face trees are like, ah, my body. uh." But they need the the most love and care. They do, honestly, they do. Those angsty teen trees. Sorry, I interrupted. Without without the 1% for parks, we're going to have a bunch of angsty Angsty teen teen trees that don't have the love and support that they need to grow up to be full, mature Yes. functional trees yes in society yeah we need to show those trees that it gets better it gets yes. better <laughs> if you relate it to that it makes yes. it sin anyway but also speaking of people <laughs> um one of the other aspects too uh that we talked a lot about in the interviews that we that we did with our members was cooling sensors and still the need for to improve those and codify cooling centers and making sure that they actually have funding. I think that is definitely still a key piece that we're chasing within this extreme heat space because that social infrastructure is really important as well. And cooling centers can be more than, as we heard from our from our other guests, can be more than just cooling centers where you just go sit down and be cool, right? You can there's opportunity for for programming and cultural aspects and community building and, you know, networking. There's a lot of opportunity there as well. Something that that we really want to see is making sure that in the same way that the building code prevents uh, residents from getting too cold in their units, we want to see that there is a right to cooling protected. Uh, and there there's a, a number of ways that this could look, but there should be something on the books that says temperatures shouldn't exceed X degrees Fahrenheit to make sure that the responsibility isn't just on tenants to make sure that they're safe in their homes, because that's not, that's not how it works for running water. That's not how it works for heat. So why wouldn't it work the same way, uh, for, for cooling? So that's something that is definitely a strong policy goal. But right now there's some some ambiguity in terms of how that will will manifest. I think there's a lot of momentum both at the the city and state level from various conversations that I've been in that that people want to see this and there's a lot of organizations like We Act that have been pushing for this, but we'll have to be very creative in how we push for it. There is some precedent, I believe, in other states, but yeah, we have to apply it to the New York political context. So that's something to look out for. Um, and that's definitely something that you can plug into if, you know, you stay tuned on city council. But if you're not already on the, the newsletter for WE Act, um, updates about extreme heat advocacy and what the extreme heat coalition is doing. That's one way to stay tapped in. Great. Yeah. So what are ways that folks can get involved with this work around extreme heat? If they heard what you said and are really excited to help move that work forward, what are ways that they can do that? Yeah. So you can stay tuned for our extreme heat policy agenda. We also, there, there's definitely going to be like some public actions coming up and community focused events around extreme heat. So I would just recommend staying tuned to our newsletters or social media. And also, uh, if you want like a more long term way to stay plugged into this work, uh, the Climate Justice Working Group does a, a lot around extreme heat. And they also are actively engaged on the Climate Ready Uptown plan, um, which very much focuses on that social resilience piece of uh, responding to extreme heat. So I would definitely recommend that. And throughout this heat season, you know, we can kind of see how city council moves and responds to uh, what we're asking for and 
climate week is definitely a time to really get activated because that is when they want to start doing victory laps. And if they've been slacking, that's how we blow the whistle on them and get them to, to pick it up on environmental justice um, and for the purposes of this conversation, extreme heat action. So that's what I would say. Awesome. Thank you so much, Caleb. We appreciate you being on the podcast and sharing some insights about the work that you're doing and ways that folks can get involved with it. So we'll leave it at that and hope to have you back soon. Thanks, y'all. Happy Pride Month. Thanks for listening. Check out We Act on Facebook at We Act for EJ. That's W-E-A-C-T-F-O-R-E-J. Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at We Act for EJ. W-E-A-C-T number four, E-J. And check out our website, weact.org, for more information about environmental justice. If you have questions or comments about the show, you can also reach out to us directly by emailing podcast at weact.org. Okay, thanks. Bye. (laughs) And stay cool.